Good morning. We are going to start with children's story time this morning so all the young kids can come down to the stage while we sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me when I'm good and I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, but it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. All right, let me see your lights. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Don't let the devil put it out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let the devil put it out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let the devil it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Okay, I know you're thinking it. Where is Mr. Kent? Yeah, come on, this isn't right. Who's this guy? Hmm, well, let me tell you. Mr. Kent went with a group of other people from our congregation to go to McAllen, Texas, and encourage the Christians that live there. Now, who knows where McAllen is? Yeah. All right, I'm going to give you a clue. Okay, McAllen is south of us. You know, directions like north, south, east, west. Okay, McAllen is south, so... On the count of three, I want all the kids on the stage to point where you think South is. Ready? One, two, three, point. Okay. The adults, I didn't ask you because I know what would have happened. When you come into this building, something happens and everything gets twisted around and we don't quite know where it is, right? Well, who knows what this is? A compass? And what do we use compasses for? Yeah, to know where you are, where you're pointing. So if I use my compass and I look around, I can see that it tells me south is that way. Past Miss Brenda, if you keep going that way. So if we could see for a long, long way that way, we might see Mr. Kent and all the people that are in McAllen. That's where they are. So compasses are really cool. They can, they can help us know where we're pointing. But what's something else, when you're talking about God, what can we use as our compass to know about God? Do you have an idea? What, what's this thing? It's a Bible. And what's in the Bible? Words. But where do the words come from? God. Isn't that so cool that we have this book and we can read words that are said by Jesus, or God, people that talk to God, we can read all their words. We can use these words as our guide, almost like a compass. You guys remember David, right? He wrote a bunch of songs. Well, listen to this song that he wrote, talking about using or wanting God to guide him. He says this in what we call Psalm 143. Teach me to do what you want because you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. So David was singing this song. He's like, God, let your spirit lead me. And so when we're looking around and we're trying to figure out which way to go and how to follow God, we can use the Bible and his words and ask him to help lead us. Okay, these are the people that love you out here. So wave at them all the way over here, up in the balcony, over there. 
And now let's go sit back with our family and friends. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Thanks, Matt. Good job. Welcome to the Edmund Church of Christ. We're so glad you're here today. It's good to see everyone here. Those joining us online, we welcome you. It's always nice to have you with us. I don't know about you, but my phone woke me up an hour earlier this morning. It was really dark outside. <laughs> and it was early. But we're all here now, and it's good to be here. It's good to be together. Let's put the QR code up on the screen. If you don't mind, just check in. Let us know you're worshiping with us today, whether you're in person or online. Whether you're a member of this church family or you are one of our honored guests today, please check in. Just take out your phone, open your camera app, hold it up to that code, give you a little link. Just click on that link, answer a couple of questions. That'll, that's a huge favor you can do for us. It helps us stay connected. It helps us know who is here, who's participating. So thanks for doing that. If you got in here without a communion packet, you need one of those, just raise your hand. We have some guys who can make sure you get one of those. Just keep your hand up. They'll see you and make sure you get a communion packet if you need one. If you are a first-time guest, we are so thankful that you're here. Go by our Welcome Center. Right out here, you'll, you can't miss it. You'll see a couple of friendly faces there, Kevin and Katie. They have a special gift for you if you're a first-time guest. And if you are wanting information about this church, if you are maybe wondering how, is, how do you become a member of this church, they can help you with that. So don't hesitate to go by the Welcome Center. Visit with Kevin and Katie. They'd be glad to welcome you. And let me just say to our members, look around and see if you recognize or don't recognize someone around you. If you don't recognize someone around you, go introduce yourselves to them after our service this morning. And we want to be a welcoming congregation, and it takes all of us to do that. We are glad you're here. I, I hear that congratulations are in order to OCA. Some of the guys uh, last night got runner-up in the state basketball contest, and so we... Uh, Congratulate OCA, yeah, that's great. A lot of our families are connected with, with OCA, and of course we share a gym, and so uh, we are proud of them. This is spring break for a lot of people, and uh, as Matt said, we have a group almost to McAllen by now. They left San Antonio this morning where they spent the night. Everything seems to be going well on the trip. They plan to get to McAllen today and have a meal and worship with the Alamo congregation there this afternoon or this evening and then begin their service projects and classes and everything else uh, this week. And so please continue to pray for them. I know that they would appreciate that, that God would do great things among them, in them, and through them to bless that community down there, to shine the light of Jesus. So please pray for them. Because it's spring break, we know a lot of our people are traveling and and maybe that's what brought you here, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, of course, to all of our members, it's so good to be together. It's good to see you as well. This morning, as we worship God, let's keep in mind how blessed we are. Let's keep in mind that God is always in control, that no matter what's going on in our world, no matter what's going on in our own lives, we can look to God and we can have faith in Him that he knows what is best, that he is, his wisdom surpasses ours, and his plan is perfect. And while we don't always understand the things that are happening around us and in our world, we can trust him. And that gives us a great sense of peace. This morning we're going to talk about the peace that God provides. The peace, as scripture says, that passes understanding, that transcends our own ability to understand, to manufacture, to come up with on our own. It's beyond our comprehension, and that peace is available to all of us. And so with a heart of gratitude and with a soul that is anchored in the peace and the hope that God provides, let's worship together with all of our hearts. As we begin this morning, if you don't mind, let's stand together, and let's read out loud from Psalm 34, verse 3 to set our hearts ready for worship today. Read this with me. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship. 
worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of all. The universe, all praise to Him we give. Alleluia to the King of kings. Alleluia to the Lamb. Alleluia to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Please be seated. Father, we love you. We worship and adore. It's good to see each of you. Will you bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer? Holy Father, we offer our hearts and this prayer in the name of our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. We are so joyful today that you have overcome the world. Father, we know that you have defeated our enemies who drag us away from you, who try and defeat us, who try and distract us. Father, we are grateful that you have conquered death and sin through Jesus. Father, that just makes us happy, and we look forward to the day when that is all gone. We are thankful that you bring us mercy and peace, and that we have peace with you and peace with each other. Father, we struggle to think and to act and to be as we should. We struggle with sin. Grant us your presence. Grant us your strength and your wisdom to deal with that. We want to fully give ourselves to you as individuals, as a church. Help us to do that. Father, we are too easily distracted. We are weak so often. We look forward to the day when you restore the world how it was at the beginning. Father, take away the pain and the sin of this fallen world that we live in. Many of us are sick. We are grieving. We are hurting in many, so many ways. We're lonely, we're anxious. Father, we ask that you heal us, that you bring comfort to us, that you pick us up, lift us up. 
from the pains that we have. Give us companionship when we're sad and lonely. Bring us peace when we're anxious. We want to be your followers, and we are your followers. We want to be your disciples. Help us to make more disciples, to bring others to you, to bring you glory and honor because we have done that. Father, may we make our focus what you focus on. We, may we make our desires the things that you desire. Father, we desire to be those who share your love, but we often fail. Forgive us. Use us and strengthen us as we proclaim your word to the world. Thank you for hearing and for answering our prayers. We know that your love is great. Help us to be your love on this earth. Help us to be in your love. Help us to love in our homes, in our community, and in the world. Father, grant us grace and peace. Amen.
Take out your communion packets now, please. You know, in our classes, especially the Wednesday night early bird class, we've been studying about the life of Christ, and most recently about his crucifixion and what he went through. Of course, in our Sunday morning classes, we're getting to that point. But during this time that we remember the intense agony, the hurt, the loneliness that Jesus felt, all for us, I remember the sufferings, the beatings, the things that hurt his body. I remember too a little bit about the supper before with his disciples where he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body. I would like for you at this time in your mind's eye to think about these, to picture you Picture them in your mind as we partake of the bread. Heavenly Father, please grant us your wisdom 
and your kindness. And help us all to remember what you went through, that you died for us, that you suffered for us. And may we be ever more responsive to your will and living our lives accordingly. In your son's name, amen. As I was getting dressed this morning, knowing that I had the privilege of leading in communion, I put on a red tie. What does this tie stand for? It stands for the blood of my Lord and Savior. Visualize in your minds the Roman soldier as he takes that spear and thrusts it up in the rib cage and into the pericardium and the heart of Jesus. And blood mixed with water came forth. He's died. Died for our sins. And he just wants us to help remember this, these events. So as we partake of the fruit, keep these thoughts in our mind. Father, you love us so much, more than perhaps we can ever understand or even live up to. But just thank you for your, your sacrificial death for us. These things I pray in your son's name. Amen. Before the pandemic hit us, we always took this time to pass the collection plate. But since then, we have decided to do it differently. And if you haven't already given money online, you can do that. Or you can perhaps mail it in. There's even a box outside the office you can deposit it. And there's boxes on tables out in the foyer. And help us to remember that it is these opportunities and the money that we are giving back to our Lord that help us to have what we have here, that help us to be able to support other people in proclaiming the gospel worldwide. Let's pray. Father, help us to never be selfish with the things that we have, but be willing to give each and every occasion to seek your guidance and your prayers, your presence. And I pray, too, that we're always faithful to you and allow your guidance and your love even more so in our life. In his son's name, amen.
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but, everything, but every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and the peace of God which present transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. There is no children's Bible hour this morning, but we do have a song before Randy brings our message. So would you please stand? <clears throat> For those of you that don't know, our children's ministry has a, a, a night once a month called Children's, no, Connect Kids Worship. Connect Kids Worship. It's greater like fifth or sixth. They get to sing. We have a, a Bible study. And the songbooks they use are small three ring binders with pages that are just paper in there and you can always tell their favorite songs because those are the ones that are worn out and ripped out and in the front pocket this is one of those songs so any of those connect kids out there this is your favorite song i want to hear it 
These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of heaven and darkness and sword, but still we are. us into its mold and conform us to its ways. But God calls us to be holy, to be different. Being different means letting God transform every area of your life. Are you ready to be different? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's what this series is all about. In many respects, that's what being a follower of Jesus is all about, is not giving in to the ways of the world, not letting the world shape you in the way that you think and live and act and react, but rather being transformed, being changed, being different because of God's work in your life to renew your mind, to restore hope and peace and joy and all the things that cause us to stand out from a world that doesn't know God. Are you different? I think it's a question worth thinking about. Are you different? This past week I read that there was a newly discovered asteroid that was roughly the size of an Olympic-sized swimming pool headed towards Earth and according to this article there was a small chance that it could collide with Earth in 23 years. Now you'll be happy to know this isn't an actual picture of that. This is what they call an artist rendering, or I don't know what it is, it's probably clip art. Maybe it's a scene from one of the 10 movies that have that as a storyline, I I don't know. But this is true that they have found this, this new asteroid out there. And officials at NASA are saying, mark your calendars for February 14th 2046, and that's when it could possibly collide with Earth. That's Valentine's Day, really? So you might want to hold out on buying your chocolates just yet. Calculations show that this asteroid, which by the way is named 2023DW, obviously NASA doesn't have a marketing department, they let the scientists name it, They say that it has about a 1 in 600 chance of hitting Earth. About 1 in 600 chance. So you're saying there is a chance. 
right? But since it's a fairly recent discovery, they need to do more studies and observations and really need to know more before they can say definitively. You know my first reaction when I saw this? I thought, oh man, something else to worry about. In case there's not enough going on in our world, in case there's not enough in our society and, and throughout the world and in our lives to, to cause anxiety and to cause stress and to be worried about, now all of a sudden Valentine's Day in 30 or 23 years is going to be ruined? We don't need something else to worry about. Let me ask you, do you ever find yourself worrying about what might happen? Do you ever feel anxious? Do you ever feel anxiety? You see, worry is what happens when we focus on the regrets of the past and the uncertainties of the future. And most of us know what it's like to worry. We look over our shoulder and we think, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did that happen? Why did someone hurt me in that way? Why did they say that to me? Why did they do that? Why did I go through that? We, we have those regrets and those things occupy our minds and we can't get over them and, and we don't know what to do with them and we worry about them. And then we look to the future, the unknown future and the uncertainties of the future and we worry about that. What's the doctor going to say? What are the tests going to show? What's the biopsy going to reveal? Are the stock markets going to be in a good place by the time I'm ready to retire? Are they going to call me back about the job interview? We worry and we worry and we worry. You put on top of that the anxiety that we feel when our perceived needs go unmet or our expectations get violated or just the stress that we feel of being burdened by life. And now we're worried that our bank might not be around. There's so much to worry about. Maybe you know what it's like for your mind to spin, for your heart to race, for your body to, to stiffen with the stress and the anxiety of worry. Maybe you know what that's like to be awakened at 3 a.m. Can't go back to sleep. And your mind is just racing with thoughts. And of course, as people of faith, Jesus' words echo in our heads. Jesus' simple instruction, his simple command, three words, do not worry. <coughs> do not worry. That's easy for you to say, Jesus. You haven't made any mistakes. You don't have any regrets. And you know the future. My goodness, you can control the future. You hold the future in your hands. And so, yeah, we can see where you might not worry, but that's not us, Jesus. We've made lots of mistakes. There's lots of things that have happened that we regret. We worry about those things. And we don't know the future. And we're concerned about what might happen. Listen, you want to be different? You want to stand out from, a, from an anxious world? Do you want to have a level of peace that, as Scripture says, surpasses understanding? Do you want to live in such a way that draws people to your God, the God of peace? It's possible. Scripture tells us how that can happen. We can see from God's word. Before we go to the text today, though, I want us to, to be clear. So let me, let me clarify what I mean by worry and anxiety and, and maybe what I, what I don't mean. I'm not talking about those who suffer with an anxiety disorder or those who have anxiety because of trauma, like PTSD. There are treatments available and they're highly recommended. I'm also not talking about acute anxiety. Actually, anxiety sometimes does good work. Acute anxiety is, is in that moment when you feel this rush of anxiety that causes you to instinctively react. Someone in front of you slams on their brakes, you're going to feel anxious in that moment. And hopefully you're going to react in some way that may very well save your life or keep further damage from happening. You see, that's acute. 
anxiety. What we're talking about here is chronic anxiety. The feeling that someone is always in front of you slamming on the brakes. The feeling that there is always a perceived threat of your mind being occupied by what others did or didn't do or what's going to happen or might happen or what didn't happen or what has happened. And just like when someone slams on their brake, you become reactive. You react. But it's not just in a moment of actual threat. It's in a lifetime of all this perceived threat. And so you live with this constant sense of fear and anxiety and worry and discontentment. You see, that's chronic anxiety. And I think that's what Paul is talking about when he writes these very inspiring, very encouraging words in what we call Philippians chapter 4. If you have a Bible, look at Philippians chapter 4. We read it just a moment ago, but it's obviously worth reading again. In fact, it's worth imprinting on our hearts and our minds. This is a beautiful text. Philippians chapter 4. Starting in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. It's important to understand the context here. If you have your Bible open, you might just look up a few verses above this text, and you'll see what the context is is for Paul's statement here. In fact, some would argue it is the context for the entire letter, and that is this interpersonal conflict between two ladies in the Philippian church, Yodia and Syntyche. They, they have a disagreement. They have a conflict. And Paul says, instead of drawing lines and building walls, find a way to come together. Be at peace with each other. And then it makes sense, knowing that context, what he says here next rejoice in the Lord. He says it twice. He says, I'll say it again, rejoice. That's his way of emphasizing. If it's worth saying one time, it's worth saying again, rejoice in the Lord. This word means celebrate the Lord. Find joy in the Lord. And I think that statement becomes almost foundational for what Paul says about worry. If we can learn to rejoice, if we can learn to find joy in life that comes from the Lord, if we can learn to celebrate who God is and what he has done, then it leaves little room for worry and anxiety. I think that's why he starts with this, rejoice in the Lord. Let me say it again, rejoice. It's not just a, a, a greeting that you overlook. This is important. Be joyful. We talked about that earlier in this series, how that sets us apart from the world of cynicism, having true joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Let me say it again. Rejoice. And then he says, don't be anxious about anything. That word anxious there, I'm told that it means to, to be torn apart. Imagine an internal tug of war being pulled in different directions. And if you struggle with anxiety, you know that's exactly how it feels. I just feel torn in different directions. I just can't find this inner peace about me. There's always turmoil. There's always this pulling and tugging and tension. See, that's what worry is. That's what anxiety does. It tears us up. Now, interestingly, this is the same word here that Paul uses in Philippians 4, it's the same word, anxious, that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. But in our English translations, it's usually translated as worry. So let's look at Jesus' text, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than than clothes. And if you know this story, you know Jesus goes on to say, look at the flowers of the field. Look at how God takes care of them. 
Look how beautiful they are. They're clothed in this beauty from God. Now look at the birds in the air. God takes care of them. If God takes care of the birds and the flowers, how much more do you think he'll take care of you? So what are you worried about? And then he continues in verse 31. So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Listen to this. He says, but seek first his kingdom. Contrasting the pagans who run after the things of the world that we think are so important, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, they'll be added to you. They'll be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So again, it's the same word used here, the same Greek word. Anxious, as Paul says it, worry, as Jesus says it. And if you take these two texts and you sort of put them on top of each other, just overlap them, I, I think you begin to see this theology of worry and anxiety emerge. It begins to take shape. And you really get to see God's perspective on worry and anxiety. And you also get to see some very practical things that we can do to not be people who are anxious. Now, all of us have some level of anxiety. But some of us have chronic anxiety. And I think Scripture gives us insight into how we can be people who pursue peace rather than worry about tomorrow. So let me just share three or four things with you. These are pretty practical. You may want to jot them down. You may want to remember them. Things that, that may be helpful to you or may be helpful to someone you know. And the first one is this. Be present. Be present. Jesus says, don't worry about what? Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I'm glad Jesus said that because he's acknowledging, yes, there are things in life that are worrisome. There is trouble in this world. It's not like Jesus is saying, listen, you don't have any trouble, so what are you worried about? He acknowledges, yes, life is filled with trouble. There are troubling times. There are circumstances. There are events. There are people sometimes that are troubling. But worrying doesn't change it, does it? Worrying doesn't change those things. As someone has said so well, worry doesn't change the past, nor does it control the future. Me worrying about an asteroid hitting Earth in 23 years is not going to change the trajectory of that big rock. It's just not going to happen. Worry doesn't do anything. So be present in today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Be fully present in today. Be present with the people that you are with. If you have children, your children need you to be present with them. Because let me tell you, they're not going to be in your direct influence very long. It goes by fast. So be present with them. They need that. If you're married, be present with your spouse. Be present on the job with your coworkers, with your friends. Be fully present. An author tells a story about a college professor who on one day in class, he walked in, he looked at a student on the front row, and he asked him, how long have you lived? The student just said his age. The professor said, no, that's, that's how long your heart has been pumping blood. How long have you lived? And then the professor told this story that was life-changing for him. He said when he was in fourth grade, his class took a field trip to the Empire State Building in New York City. And at that time, this was many years ago, at that time it was the tallest building in the world. He said when he as a nine-year-old got off the elevator and walked out to the observation deck, he said time stood still. He said in that magical, mystical moment, I looked over the entire city of New York City and he said, it was just amazing. He said, I was fully alive in that moment. He said, if I live a million years, that moment will always stand out in my consciousness because in that moment, I was alive. He told that story and then he looked back at the student. And he said, now, let me ask you again, how long have you lived? The student said, well, I mean, since you put it that way, I don't know, maybe, maybe an hour, maybe a minute or two. 
Let me ask you, how long have you lived? How long have you been fully alive? We spend so much of our lives worrying. We spend so much of our lives distracted. We spend so much time not fully present in the moment. The author who told this story went on to say that some psychologists have said that the average person spends 47% of their time thinking about something other than what they are currently doing. Now, I'm not adding the numbers right now, but I can see that some of you, that is true right now in this moment. You're thinking about something other than what you're doing. He says this, we're half present half the time, which means we're half alive. Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Listen, today has enough challenge. Today has enough trouble. Be fully present in this moment. Be fully present today. Number two, be prayerful. Be prayerful. Jesus says, rather than worry, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the things of God. Seek God. Turn your focus away from the worries of the world. Remember what he said, the pagans run after these things. But you, you seek first God's kingdom. You look to him. You pursue him. You turn your eyes to him and your ears to him. You see, prayer is the faith response to worry. Let me say that again. Prayer is the faith response to worry. Paul says in Philippians 4, rather than being anxious, be what? Be prayerful. In every situation, he says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. Every situation. I gotta be honest with you. I struggle with praying about every situation. I struggle with praying about the the common things that seem to bother me. Because I know God is busy. There are bigger things. There are more more important things going on in this world than my simple concerns. And yet I read right here, Paul says, in every situation, by prayer and petition. You see, we bring our petitions to God. But I think even Paul's statement here about in every situation, it reminds us what prayer really is. Prayer is not about me getting what I want. Prayer is about me connecting with God, finding God, hearing God. It's not just turning our eyes to God. It's opening our ears to God and hearing God. It's about fellowship with God, connection with God, communion with God. And through that connection, through that relational exchange of prayer and listening and meditating on his word, through that connection with God. You know what God does? He brings about transformation. Do you remember back in the very first scripture that's part of the little video intro? Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think a lot of that takes place in prayer. God transforms and renews our mind, the way we think, the way we see the world. And so we pray. Rather than worry, we pray. When we feel anxious, we pray. When we're concerned about what might happen or what has happened, we pray. Well, is God going to change what's going to happen or what happened? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But maybe that's not the ultimate goal. Maybe the ultimate goal is being transformed by God to have peace no matter what happens. Or happened. So be present. Be prayerful. Number three, be thankful. Sorry, it doesn't start with a P. Be thankful. He says, present your request to God with what? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. So often, our thanksgiving comes after our requests are answered. You have a shower, you get gifts, you send thank you notes. You get some gifts at your birthday or Christmas, you Say thank you. He says, you present your request with thanksgiving. Yeah, but what if I don't, what if I don't get what I'm asked for? I, I don't think that's the point. He says, you have this, this gratitude about you that you approach God with this sense of thanksgiving, no matter what happens, no matter if he gives you what you want or not. 
think we have forgotten how to say thank you. When's the last time you said thank you? We've forgotten how to say it. Be grateful to God. Be grateful to others. You see, just as worry is a way to interpret our circumstances, so is gratitude. You can choose to see the negative. You can choose to to see what might happen or regret what did happen, or you can choose to see reasons to be thankful no matter what's happening. Just stop and take inventory. Aren't you thankful? No matter what is going on in your life, no matter how difficult it is, aren't there reasons to give thanks to God? Jesus says, why do you worry about food and clothes? I think most of us here, we don't have to worry about that. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful you have clothes to wear? You have a home in which to live? You have food on your table? Aren't you thankful that you have people in your life who love you, people you love? Aren't you thankful that that every day you're given to live is an opportunity? It's an opportunity to to live and enjoy life and to discover and to see God and to to draw others to him. Those Those are opportunities. Those are gifts. Aren't you thankful that heaven is real? When you stand at the casket of a loved one, heaven becomes extremely real. Aren't you thankful it's real? Aren't you thankful that Jesus has conquered death? Aren't you thankful that he has removed your sins? Aren't you thankful that he has given you this sense of joy and peace and purpose? Aren't you thankful that salvation awaits you someday? We could go on and on. There is so much for which to be thankful. And when we are thankful, when we are rejoicing in the Lord, let me say it again, rejoice. You remember what Paul said? When we are joy-filled and thankful, there's little room to worry. Our mind is occupied not with what might happen, what did happen, what could happen, what shouldn't happen. Our mind is focused on all the things God has done for us, all the reasons we are thankful. And number four, be at peace. Isn't that what we want? We want to be at peace. Remember the context for this letter? This interpersonal conflict between these two ladies in the church in Philippi? He's saying be at peace. But it's not just be at peace with each other. Be at peace with God. Be at peace with the world. Where does that come from? He tells us. Look at verse seven. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Isn't that a great phrase? It transcends all understanding. It's a peace the world can't understand. They can't get their minds around it. We can't even fully understand it, but it can be ours. It says it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Genuine peace stands guard over your heart and your mind. Remember those perceived threats that we said that cause anxiety? The slamming of the brakes? When peace stands guard over your heart and your mind, it says, no, you can't enter into here. No, you can't threaten him or her. Peace stands guard over your heart and your mind. You see, worry doesn't just remove tomorrow's pain. Here's the problem with worry. It removes today's peace. There's nothing you can do about tomorrow's pain. If there is, just do it. Don't worry about it. But the struggle with worry and anxiety is it removes your peace today. Satan sends things to to get the guard out of the way, to remove peace so it can infiltrate your heart and your mind. I understand. It's one thing to say, be at peace. That's easy to say. You know, that's like telling a crying child, stop crying. Well, it's not that easy. Be at peace. Okay, now what? And I think to answer that now what question, we have to go back to to the source of our anxiety, to really explore what is it that we are worried about? What is causing our anxiety? There's an author, 
right now that, uh, that I'm really enjoying. His name is Steve Cuss. It's easy to remember his last name, <laughs> Cuss. I think his website's called Cuss Words or something like that. He was actually in Oklahoma City, did a conference a year or two ago, and Carrie Ann and I got to, to go and to meet him, and it was just, it was really helpful. But he talks a lot about anxiety, especially in the context of leadership. And I, and I think I agree with what he says about the sources of our anxiety, so many times where it comes from. This is what he says. He says, our anxiety comes from false beliefs, false needs, assumptions, and expectations. And we could talk about each one of those, but let me just give you a few statements that, that are examples of, of these and, and see if any of these resonate with you. See if any of these sound familiar. The statement, I need to be in control. I must be in control of this situation. Or I have to fix this. Or the statement, no one likes me. Or people should agree with me or live like I do or behave like I do. Or, I'm the smartest one in the room. Or, I'm the dumbest one in the room. Or, I need to be first. I need to be the best. I need to be needed. And then maybe the biggest one of all, I need people's approval. And think about some of the assumptions that are embedded in these statements. Think about some of the expectation violations we are setting ourselves up for. Think about some of the, the false beliefs and needs that we stake our happiness on, our lives on. We could go on and on with other examples. All of these are lies. If you want to be at peace, stop believing these lies. They come straight from Satan. Do you remember what Paul said at the end of that beautiful passage we read? He said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right, Excellent, admirable, praiseworthy. He said, do what with those things? Think about those things. Whatever is true, think about those things. In other words, don't let Satan infiltrate your heart and your mind with his lies. But think about what is true. What is true? God is in control. You bear the image of God. You are highly valued by God. You are forgiven by God through Jesus. And you have eternity to spend with God. There are some truths that should give us great peace. Should cause us to be at peace. And those are the things we need to think about. Whatever is true, think about those things. Not the lies that Satan is telling you. Look back at verse 7. I don't think it's a mistake how Paul worded this. When he talked about the peace of God, where does it come from? It comes from the God of peace in verse 9. The peace of God comes from the God of peace. He is our only source of peace. As he said, it's a peace that, that passes understanding. Again, it's not the absence of trouble. Jesus made it clear each day has enough trouble of its own. It's not the absence of trouble. What is it? It's the presence of God. The presence of God. A God who is trustworthy. A God who is reliable. A God of peace. Who provides the peace of God. So be different. Be different by being, as much as possible, a non-anxious presence. Imagine your home. Imagine your home for a minute. The people in which you live and interact, family, friends. Think about even at work. Think about the people that you normally interact with. How would those interactions, how would your life be different if you truly were a non-anxious presence? How would your marriage be different if you're married? How would your relationship with your parents or your kids be different? If you truly were non-anxious, non-reactive how would it be different is a meteor going to hit earth in 23 years I don't know I don't even know if I'll be around to see it or not 
is the sky really falling? <laughs> Boy, some of us, we sure act like it is, don't we? We don't just act like it is. We, we tell everyone who will listen to us it is. You know, this is going down the drain. The church is not going to last. The government, the country, you know, the home, the family, everything's, the sky is falling. Is there trouble in our world? Absolutely. But when we live with that mentality, the sky is falling, what type of God are we showing people? Are we drawing people into the presence of a God of peace? A God who is in control, a sovereign God who created us, who loves us, who knows what is best for us. What is your life saying to those around you? As a non-anxious person, you can draw them into the presence of the peace of God that comes from the God of all peace. That peace can be yours. If you don't know Jesus, it's time to give your life to him. Just make that choice. It's your choice. No one can force you. It's your decision. God doesn't even force you. He gives you the freedom to choose. He loves you. He wants you to love him, to give your life to him. Maybe today you're ready to be baptized into Christ, to confess your faith in Jesus, to have that peace that comes only from God, a peace that passes understanding. Don't wait. If we can encourage you, if we can pray for you, let us do that. In just a moment, a couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a little room right behind me in this hallway. You can exit out of these doors, meet them there. They'll be happy to encourage you and pray for you. Or you can come down to the front, and we'll do that as a church family. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Let's stand. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time we've had here this morning. We thank you so much, God, for this body of believers. We thank you, God, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, God, for the family that we have, for the sense of fellowship and belonging that we can have here. Lord, let that help us to be thankful. Let that help us to be at peace. Lord, let that be a witness in us to those around us that we have something 
that is better than what this world can offer. We have a peace, we have a thankfulness that is built on the rock, your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name, amen. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. You will see the QR code behind me there. You can scan that with your phone and uh, let us know of your engagement with our service this morning, and that would be much appreciated. Also, if it is your first time here with us, we have a welcome booth right out here in the foyer, and Kevin is there and would love to meet you, answer any questions that you might have, and, and help you out in any way possible. So swing by and talk with him. Uh, we also want to let you know that we had a baptism recently, Peyton Little. Let's see her picture there. Uh, let's be sure to reach out to her, let her know how pleased we are that she made that decision and, and just be a support for her at this time. Uh, we want to let you know about Commission Sunday. Last week we did a special collection for Commission Sunday and raised 100, over $127,000. And this all focuses directly on mission efforts across the world. So we know that God's going to do amazing things with that. And we are just are so thankful for the generosity that this congregation showed. Uh, along with mission efforts, our McAllen mission trip left yesterday and should be arriving today. So we just ask that everyone here uh, focus on prayer and on uh, just doing everything we can for that group, that we pray for their safety, we pray for success on that trip, and uh, that that goes well for them. We want to invite you back at 5 o'clock this evening for congregational singing, and that will be here in the auditorium. And then next week at 5 o'clock on Sunday, we will have our Somos Uno meeting. And that's an event that we have with our Spanish-speaking ministry here at church. And so we're looking forward to that. And immediately following that, we will have our Hot Dog It's Spring Fellowship. And that is usually in the Circle Drive. So please join us for that as well. And with that, you are sent.